Monday the 15th of June 2009. This is an unexpected chapter in my book. In fact, it could turn into a book on its own. I've been presented with the opportunity to run in the New York Marathon in November 2010. I now need to decide whether to accept the offer or not. The opportunity has arisen through the National Heart Foundation Inspired Adventures. I would be required to fundraise $12,500, which would cover travel costs and a place in the marathon, as well as $7,500 of that total going to the Heart Foundation. Will I do it? I'm tempted. Very. The challenge excites me. Both challenges, actually. One being fundraising $12,500 over 17 months and increasing people's awareness of heart disease. The other, training for a marathon. I've always said that I'd never run a marathon. They're insane. Your body's not meant to run for that sort of distance or to be put under that toll. But I guess lately, with all my city surf training, I'm seeing that differently. And I guess that what makes me realise that I'm meant to do this. This is God's plan. You see, it goes back to July last year. Pneumonia. Tour de France. Yes, Tour de France. And a month before that, the 11 kilometer mark in City to Surf. Let me explain. Welcome everyone. It's Andrew Neville checking in for episode three of the Running With Heart podcast. Um, this week, we're looking at Running With Heart. Um, my cause, my mission when it comes to running, my ministry. Um, and we're looking at where it began, um, how it began and why it began. And Hopefully, by the end of this podcast, you'll have a better understanding of um, my passion behind running and running with heart and what I do for the Heart Foundation and the journey that has been there since day one. So um, that little excerpt I read um, is from a book I wrote um, called Born to Run, um, based on my earlier running um, and particularly the City of Surf journey. Uh, we're going to go back and continue on in that um, journal entry, Monday the 15th of June 2009. I'm explaining pneumonia, Tour de France, yes you heard that right, Tour de France, and City to Surf 11 kilometer mark. So 15th of June 2009. I was bored with running, over it, completely. The little kid from Mathara, known as Deke, was ready to let it go. Why? Pneumonia, firstly. At the time, I was just getting over it. About about that had me in bed for two weeks. And secondly, City to Surf was approaching, but I wasn't excited about it, as I didn't feel like I was really running it. I was just there, really just going through the motions. Since 1995, since 1995, I'd wanted to run the City to Surf, but I never got to. So with the fast approaching, I was simply over it. Over running, there was no challenge. The Tour de France was on TV, and it had me in. That is a challenge, I thought. I wouldn't mind having a go at that. Cycling, cycling was now becoming an option. I'd heard about the Heart Foundation offering challenges in some of the stages of the Tour de France. I could train for that, I thought. And so it was decided. Once my commitment to City Surf was complete, I would commence my cycling training. No more running. Then it happened. As we know, the fateful 11 kilometer mark at City Surf where the chain dropped and I ran, and in doing so, I reawoke that lost hunger in my heart. Fast track to now. Nearly 12 months on, and I've been training ever since that 11 kilometer mark. That's the longest I've kept to a running training program. Even when I spent time and time again in bed late last year, sick, I simply readjusted my program. The goal was the same, sit as surf. And now I have this New York Marathon Challenge present itself. And I've never been in a better position to accept it. Looking back on the last 12 months, I believe God presented me with the 11 kilometer mark to get me back on track to awaken my heart. To put me on the road to making a difference to people's heart. Spiritually and physically. If I get to stand at the starting line of the New York Marathon, I'll be standing there in God's presence, remembering that exact moment in Sid Surf, the 11 kilometer mark, where I felt the freedom of running once again. Because that is where the journey would have begun. And it will be the moment that takes me to the spot on the starting line in New York City. And then we jump forward less than a month. Less than a month it was. Um, where 
I thought I was going to be applying to run the City Surf. Um, remembering this is back in 2009. Um, we're talking about applying for City Surf. Applying for the New York Marathon, um, which was going to be 2010. This is in June 2009. Um, and there's an entry here, 6th of July 2009. So only a few weeks after writing that New York was a real opportunity. On the New York front, that slight hurdle became a major roadblock. Actually, roadblock is not the word as the road is no longer there. It's been swept away in an avalanche. I spoke to the Hart Foundation last week about putting in my application. And I was told that I could submit it. But they didn't know what was happening with New York next year as someone had left the Hart Foundation. When I spoke to them on Monday, I was told that the contract with the company who helped organise it had fallen through and the Hart Foundation were no longer sending runners. I was disappointed, but obviously running New York is not in God's plan for me at the moment. But why are there all the signs for the Hart Foundation lately? And I remember during that period, and I was talking about it recently with Lara Pinto, the different signs that pop up um, at various stages of the journey that lead you into that direction of committing to something like Lara Pinta. And the same thing in that three-week period there when I started to get really excited about the opportunity um, to run the New York Marathon. I remember um, going to a friend's funeral um, and at the walking the church at the front, there was a request for donations to the Heart Foundation instead of flowers. And so the Heart Foundation again popping into mind and little things like that during that period. And I thought I was really on track to possibly running New York, um, which would have been in 2010. And just like that in July 2009, it just ended. Um, it was really strange um, with the correspondence that I guess I'd received at the time through the Heart Foundation and leading towards applying for that marathon. And then it just ended. And that was it. So I went back to focusing on City to Surf and my running um, there, not knowing that it would be three years down the track where I would actually get to run the New York Marathon when it was God's time, I guess you could say. So it's important now to look at as I focus on City to Surf. So I had that touch, um, brief touch with the Heart Foundation and the possibility of running for Heart, running with Heart. Um, that was in 2009. Now I want to give an, a picture of who I was, I guess, as a runner um, in this period when I'm focusing on City to Surf. Um, as I mentioned in that chapter in my Born to Run book, I trained for years um, for City to Surf since making it to state cross country in 95 um, back at school. And my goal was to run City to Surf. I remember cutting out the application used to be in the newspaper, the, the Sun Herald, and that's what you'd fill in. It wasn't online. Um, I even bought a singlet. <laughs> it was a cotton singlet. It was far from the running technical singlets we have these days. Um, it was a cotton singlet, which I got to wear in training. I started training. Um, every year, though, I'd either get sick or we'd have a family commitment on. I would have been around 17, 18 when I first started training for City Surf. But every year, I'd start training and I'd never go through with it or something would happen on the City Surf weekend. Sick, family commitments. And I never got to train. And it wasn't until I started my business and I had a client come to me who wanted to run the City Surf that I actually got to run it for the first time. And that reawoke that passion for running and City Surf. So Sunday, the 8th of August, 2010. 2010, the year after that last entry. 60 minutes 20. 30 minutes 34 at 7 kilometres. 12 minutes 21 at 3 kilometres. 48 12 at 11 kilometers all numbers but this is where my mind was this is how i was thinking this is how i broke down my running back in 2010 heart rate at the end was 202 beats per minute my average heart rate was 192 100 under 100 by the 31 minute mark so that's 31 minutes after the race i nearly threw up on the finish line i had to hold it down i had a stitch in the final kilometer nothing left in the tank i still sprinted from the final bend Born to Run was playing over the speakers. I ran my lines really well. Heartbreak Hill was really tough. I considered walking. Overall, I'm happy with my race. I couldn't have done anything better on race day. More hill work in training, especially in the month leading up to it. The winner did it in 41.05. So that is my recap of City of Surf 2010, breaking down the course, my splits, and my overall time, 60.20. Then we jump ahead, so... I had run the Gold Coast Half Marathon um, in 2010, um, in July. 
did that sit of surf, which I've just recapped there in my journal entry. And then we jump ahead to where I ran the half, the Sydney Morning Herald half marathon um, in March. Um, and it's the first time that I run for the Heart Foundation, picking them as my charity. Friday the 13th of May 2011. It's been a tough week. My health hasn't been the best this week as I've battled the flu trying to get hold of me. To make it tougher, I have the Sydney Morning Half Marathon on Sydney Morning Herald Half Marathon on this Sunday, an event I've been training for since early March. However, it hasn't been bothering me as much as I thought it would. The idea of doing all the training, then missing out on the race. And I believe that's because I'm I've turned my running over to God. I'm always seeking his will in my running. I know he has a plan, I need to have faith and follow him regardless. Monday the 16th of May 2011. God blessed me yesterday, enabling me to run the Sydney Morning Herald Half Marathon after being sick for most of the week. When I consider how I was feeling on Friday afternoon, it was nothing short of a miracle that God performed just to be able to get me to the starting line and then to run the 21.1 kilometres on top of that. I was unable to run my, my usual pace, but that didn't matter. It wasn't about me. It was about raising money for the Heart Foundation. As I crossed the finish line, my time read an hour 54, 23 seconds. It's around 17 minutes slower than my debut half marathon last year. The time did, didn't disappoint me, as perhaps it once would have. It was such a great feeling running today, dedicating each kilometre to someone else, someone who was loved by someone and perhaps were battling or had battled heart disease. Perhaps so, they were just loved. With the half marathon cross off, it's now time to set focus on City to Surf, which is just under three months away. So that's the first time I ran with the um, Heart Foundation. Um, it wasn't an official running and such where I'd apply to run with them. It was like we see many of the running events these days where the charity, um, they give you a list of, list of charities um, to pick from um, when you sign up to the event and you can choose to raise money for that charity or not. And that year I, I did choose the Heart Foundation um, and use them as my charity. And I remember... That was the first time I dedicated kilometres to um, people. Um, and I wrote those names on my arm as I ran. And um, said a prayer for them and dedicated each kilometre as the kilometre markers passed in that event. So now we're going to jump ahead once more. Um, another journal entry, um, 12 months later, or sorry, City of Surf 2011, so a few months after that half marathon. And this is my review of Sitter's Surf in 2011, remembering how I broke it down in 2010 with the splits, times, etc. Frustrated, disappointed, happy, proud, all the emotions I feel when looking back at Sunday's Sitter's Surf. It wasn't to be my race. I missed out on all three goals. I didn't achieve my ultimate goal of 57.07. I missed out on a sub-60 time as well. I even missed out on beating last year's time. I ran 62.14. Last year was 60.27. So what happened? What went wrong? After a near faultless preparation. Before What happened on race day? Before I analyse every detail, let's review the race. I arrived at Hyde Park to pouring rain around 7am. Instead of a warm-up jog in rain, I walked back to the Woolworths with Monique and then walked her to Town Hall Station. I then jogged back to Hyde Park. I joined the red group, second row from the back, at 7.40am. I kept moving with both dynamic and static stretching. I had a checkered run in the first four kilometres with people in the way, and I found it frustrating, the slower speed on the downhills and uphills due to the people in front. Remained patient. I ran two kilometres in nine minutes and four kilometres in 18 that's 4.30 a kilometre pace and 23 seconds per kilometre outside my goal time. I pushed hard along the flat near the water as spaces opened up. I knew I was chasing the clock. I hit Heartbreak Hill with the decision to run it hard. It was my best opportunity to make up time. I'm really pleased, really pleased with my run up the hill. No worries. So different to last year. I continued pushing along the top and started worrying when it seemed like the 8km, 9km mark was taking forever. Instant relief when I saw the 10km marker. 
realizing I had missed spotting the 9 kilometer one. A glance at my watch told me a sub-60 time was still achievable with a strong run home. At 11 kilometers, I was preparing to fly home. I was hit with a stitch. I pushed on. My pace slowed. I took a long corner to give a lone kid a high five, and that moment probably made the race for me. I kept pushing as best I could and was shocked when at 13 kilometers I was still within reach of a sub-60 time. I needed to run 3 minutes 40 per kilometer. The stitch intensified along Campbell Parade in Bondi Beach, and I was forced to slow as I applied pressure to my right side. I turned at the final bend into the 400 meters straight and enjoyed a more casual run to the finish line, and I scanned the crowd as I scanned the crowd looking for Monique. I crossed the line in 62.14, annoyed that I forgot to look at my average heart rate. My finishing heart rate was in the 170s and it was down to 113 within a few minutes. I felt like I'd been on a training run. So let's analyse. The first four kilometres was costly. 18 minutes in four kilometres was way too slow. My strategy, if running hard uphill and fast recovery downhill, was ruined by the crowd. I need to start closer to the front of the red group. Despite these four kilometres, I was still in a position to save the time in the latter kilometres, which the stitch ruined. Was it brought on by heartbreak? The first run up it? The fast run up it, sorry. Still with a kilometre to go, I could have got a sub-60. I need to include more training runs with stronger finishes. I need to push hard through stitches. I need to increase my pain barrier. The winner, Liam Adams, said that he felt terrible from 10 kilometre mark, but just hung in there. I have to be able to do that. So I walk away disappointed at not achieving my goal, but very satisfied that my training did pay off. My run-up heartbreak hill was something I'm very proud of. It made all the training runs over Garland's worth it. My most memorable part of the race was running across the road to give the lone child a high five. I hope that he remembers that and it maybe one day inspires him to run or to put others first. And that moment gets me thinking, or maybe hearing God's voice. Maybe seeing his plan for my running. At, l at least maybe it's opened my eyes. My most satisfying run was Sydney Half Marathon in May when I ran dedicated kilometres for those affected by heart disease. My most satisfying moment in Sidda's surf was, hopefully, making a child's day by giving him a high five. In both races in which I had trained really well, I didn't get to run the race I had planned for different reasons. I was sick for the half marathon and the crowd and the stitch today. But I still could walk away satisfied due to putting others first. Maybe my running shouldn't and doesn't need to be about me, about chasing PBs, etc. Maybe my running needs to be make, about making a difference to others, changing lives. Maybe that's how my running ministry is meant to work, running with heart. So that is in 2011 Sitter's Surf, where my eyes were open, I guess, to perhaps putting people first in my running um, as opposed to me and my times and my performances and my results and after that I think my running focus really changed where yes I, I was still had to goal times I was chasing um, but it wasn't the end all um, if I didn't get them it was about putting others first making a difference to people's lives um, and using my running in doing that so then we jump ahead into 2012, some more journaling here, um, where the Heart Foundation is becoming more of a more, I guess, of a relationship being developed between me and them. Um, Wednesday the 14th of March 2012, received a surprise email from the Heart Foundation inviting me to run as a gold charity runner in this year's City of Surf. This would mean raising $1,000 for the Heart Foundation and starting behind Red Group in the gold charity bib section. So at this point in my running, um, this is 2012, so I'm, what are we, in March? So we're three and a half months away from me, myself running my very first marathon. I'm in training for the Gold Coast Marathon at this point, and this email has arrived from the Heart Foundation. And I remember when I spoke to them about the email, I'd received it because my name had come up for raising money for them the year previously in that half marathon. Um, two days later, I wrote this in my journal. I've been giving the Heart Foundation invitation some real consideration. Not only do I feel I want to do it, but I feel I'm meant to do it. It's part of God's plan. 
one day I would love to run the New York Marathon for the Heart Foundation. But that is the top of the ladder. I'm currently at the bottom. You can't expect to jump from the bottom to the top in one go. You have to take the steps on the rungs in between. Running Sit and Surf for the Heart Foundation would be one of those rungs. Even though it means sacrificing my spot in the red group, I don't mind. I'm more excited about running for the Heart Foundation. And for me, at that time, that's, that's the huge step forward, I guess, and the change in my attitude, I guess, to suddenly... I trained and worked so hard to get that spot in red group that I'd achieved. To get a spot in red group in Sitter Surf, you've got to run under a certain time. I believe it's, it used to be 75 minutes. I believe it's now 70. Um, so to suddenly sacrifice starting in the red group, which gives you a better run in Sitter Surf, not as many people in front of you, to take that step back into the gold charity group and then do it not worrying about that, that's a huge step forward for me, I think. Um, the following morning, oh, sorry, three days later, Monday the 19th of March, I rang the, rang the Heart Foundation this morning to inquire about the Gold Charity Run. They are excited to get my phone call. They are sending me an expression of interest form. And so that's where the journey began with the Gold Charity Run for the Heart Foundation. And I went on to do that Gold Charity Run and raising the $1,000 for them, um, which was really good. And so from that, then the offer came, the inquiry from them asking me whether I'd consider applying for the New York Marathon, uh, which I ran, as we know, in 2013 for the Heart Foundation. I actually want to read a part of New York um, to continue on with how the running with Heart journey started to develop. Um, we I chose running with Heart as, I guess, the name, the branding, I guess you could say, for my running and the running ministry because it just fits in so well with the purpose behind it, the aim behind it, running with heart, running with the heart foundation, running with heart. That's my heart. Um, putting others first. It all comes back to the heart and it doesn't matter how you perform. It doesn't matter how fast you're running, how slow you're running, as long as you're running with heart. That's the, I guess the real motto behind it all. So this um, journal entry I want to read you is in 2013 now, so we've jumped again ahead. Um, this is from New York City. This is Marathon Eve. Marathon Eve in New York City, um, going from the guy in Portland, town of 2,500 people, to New York City, one of the biggest, most bustling cities in the world, about to take part in one of the largest marathons in the world. And I, I'm starting to have the doubts. I'm nervous about what's happening the next day. All along, God has been with me on this journey. I've heard his voice over the last 12 months and even before tell me that I would go to New York. On more than one occasion, he has told me not to worry. I'll take care of that. And that's the worry at the time. True to his word, he has brought me to the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. He's provided me with the opportunity to run the race of a lifetime tomorrow. A race I've longed to do. Over the past 12 months, I've educated and reached out to people on heart disease and health. In my fundraising, I've tried to keep that fitness and health focus, not just asking for money or selling my morals and beliefs short in order just to make a quick dollar for the cause. But as I prepare for the big day, I find myself asking, why am I really here? Why me? Why have I been chosen? Sure, over the 12 months, I've hopefully made a difference to at least one person's life. I've changed it in some way. Hopefully, the $13,000 I've raised will continue to affect people's life into the future to make a difference to those people affected or who could have been affected by heart disease. And that's the thing. It's called the butterfly effect. The things we do, we may never know or get to see the actual effect of it has on people. We just need to do the things. We do so praying and knowing somehow we are making a difference to somebody somewhere. We have to be content, sorry, we have to learn to be content with living our lives knowing who we have had a positive impact on and how. I still come back to the New York Marathon tomorrow. Why am I here? What's my purpose? In this great wide world, I'm just like an ant, small. Why me? Why have I been chosen to be in this position to run the New York Marathon tomorrow? As I prepare for bed, God tells me, as he has many times before, Stop worrying. Have faith. He's taking care of everything. I fall asleep.
I remember the nerves that night in New York. Um, the weight that was on my shoulders, um, probably particularly because of the $13,000 I had raised um, for the Heart Foundation, the support I'd received from Portland, Wallerowang, Lidsdale, Cullumbulan, Lithgow, Bathurst people, and across the state really, family and friends everywhere, the support I'd received both in the donation to the Heart Foundation and just in that general support and encouragement to myself. Um, and you really did feel like, and you were, you, I was representing every single one of those supporters but not only was i representing them i was also representing the heart foundation and the people that rely on the heart foundation and i think it had become such a part of me in that journey from back in 29 2010 right through to 2012 um, during the cold charity run and then to this moment um, as I'd written previously, I saw New York at the top of the, as being the top of the ladder. Um, that's now changed as I trained with Lara Pinta. Um, but to be in that position, you could, I could really feel the weight on my shoulders that I didn't want to fail. And to me, at that point, as I was getting prepared for the race, the marathon the next day, to me it was, again, it wasn't about time. It was about whether I did everyone who had supported me proud. And I wanted to make sure that running with heart was exactly that. It was, I wasn't just raising money, but I was fulfilling my side of the bargain, I guess you could say. And so it was important um, going to that race. It, I was trying to deal with those thoughts and emotions, I guess you could say. Um, now, as I lined up on Staten Island um, for that race, um, the race began, begins on Staten Island and crosses the bridge, which I can't remember the name of, and I can hardly ever pronounce it anyway, so I'm not going to try. But you run from Staten Island over the bridge into Brooklyn. And I really want to read a part um, of that, but I might come back to that in a sec. I want to jump forward now. So after um, New York did Big Red Run with Craig, as I, as I spoke about previously. That wasn't for the Heart Foundation, that was for juvenile diabetes. But it still came under the Running With Heart umbrella because it was, again, putting other people first. It wasn't about going out there and doing the best we could do in terms of time and you know podium placings and all that sort of thing. It was about raising money and awareness of juvenile diabetes. And again, coming from the heart, showing that love, and again, as I said, putting people first. And then from there, I've done smaller events. Um, for the Heart Foundation, whether it be a 10K or a half marathon or the Canberra Marathon I did as well. And then that's when I started training to try and qualify for Boston. So I could do that as an epic adventure um, for the Heart Foundation. And then, as we know from my first episode of Running With Heart, the Six Foot Track Marathon happened. And so this is an entry that comes about two, three weeks after the Six Foot Track when I'm in the period of not running and I'm contemplating my retirement. So this is just a few months ago and just before I started training for Lara Pinta and the Sonda Monster. Um, so this is Monday the 29th of March 2021. I'm not sure where my running should go from here. Retirement from anything big? Question mark. Though I still feel a pull to 100 kilometers and even the Lara Pinta. I think it's because I feel a call to do something epic for the Heart Foundation. I haven't done anything for them for at least six months. I haven't even mentioned them in my Instagram posts for ages. I think my head thinks by shutting them off like that, it will help me deal with my anxiety of a heart attack. That's another podcast, and we're going to get to that real soon. It's like a TV series where you kept in suspense. We'll come back to that anxiety. It's been a big part of my life for two years. Really, I think it's spiritual warfare and Satan's way of stopping me fulfilling, stopping me fulfill, fulfilling God's plan for me. I keep praying for guidance. So that was a few weeks before I started this journey that I am now on. Um, and we've discussed it before. I was contemplating retirement, but I still felt that pull to do something epic for the Heart Foundation. And it was more of a personal battle that was happening in my head and inside of me that was stopping me committing to something epic. Um, and as I said, then we'll, we'll get into that in another podcast real soon. So the journey of running with heart really began in 20, 2009 and it's been going for 12 years and it just, it's slowly just building, it keeps building. You, as I said, I thought New York was the top of the ladder, I thought that was the epic event. 
and then here I am eight years later, um, once again training for something arguably bigger than New York. New York on a scale in terms of people and that, it probably can't be beaten, but in terms of running 231 kilometers through the Australian outback in under 60 hours is a massive undertaking and uh, that definitely makes me more nervous than New York, that's for sure. And once again, um, with all the fundraising, with all the awareness I'll be doing over the next 12 months, it's not about me. It's not about my time out there in the outback. It's about me going from start to finish, not only in that 231 kilometers, but now. The journey's now. And it's, this is my time to make a difference to people's lives in terms of health, in terms of heart health. Um, and raise the awareness of heart attacks, the signs of the heart attack, raise awareness of the risk factors of heart disease and make educate people as well, help with the education of people when it comes to heart disease um, because it is Australia's number one killer and we need to start doing something about it. The Heart Foundation is doing incredible work, but they can't do it on their own. They need people to help them and I'm one of those people willing to put up my hand to do that if it means... Sacrificing my time for training um, to prepare for an event like this. And if it means doing an event such as this, so epic, to get that um, the spotlight shone, shone on it. Um, again, not on me, but on heart disease and the reason that I'm running. That's what it all comes back to. It's about heart, the Heart Foundation and heart disease. Now, I want to finish off um, with a, another moment from the New York Marathon just after the start. Um, if I can find it right here, here we go. The first kilometer was very slow due to the congestion, but I found myself not worrying. I'd learned patience over the years, and besides, I was running to have fun today. As we came off the bridge and into Brooklyn, and we were heading towards the beginning of a sea of spectators, everything clicked. Why I'm here running what my role was. I was running towards the left side of the road. Over on the right, there was a few kids standing, holding out their hands, wanting a high five. People were just running past them. I record my city surf runs when I saw a kid's face light up after I crossed over the road to deliver a high five, especially the one year when a lone kid had stood there being ignored by a sea of runners. I chose my path carefully and I made my way across the course through the mass of runners, arriving by the fence with my hand outstretched to deliver two perfect high fives and receive smiles in return. Then before me, the people standing in the f along the fences head out there, held out their hands, wanting high fives. I delivered. Forget line running today. I was running the edges. Along the fences, I ran with my right arm extended, high-fiving anyone who stood along the border cheering us runners on and weren't there some people either side of the split road there were they were packed cheering and screaming ringing cowbells banging other items the noise was electrifying it was just unbelievable the whole atmosphere and so from a moment that changed my attitude towards running and my running performance at Cedar Surf where the lone kid stood on the side of the road with a hand outstretched just wanting a high five and I went out of my way to give deliver that high five to then standing in New York and running New York to see that, no, well, not the same kid, but a kid again standing on the side of the road. It was like coming full circle. And it was like God saying, you are on the right path. Continue. Keep running. Run with heart. That's where we're going to end the podcast, everyone. I'll be back next week for week four. Training is going well. Um, once again, thank you for all the donations that are coming through and the encouragement. I look forward to talking to you again next week. In the meantime, run with heart.